Okay, well, we're ready to start. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Steve Fleck. And on behalf of Chapel Hill Alliance for Livable Town, which advocates for ecology and community friendly town policies, I'd like to welcome you all to Chalt's second webinar on affordable housing. More information is on the website at chalt.org. A lack of affordable housing constitutes a major durable and growing challenge for Chapel Hill as for so many other localities. Last week, we looked at the origins of our current housing problem. Today, we'll look mainly at some initiatives aimed at helping to solve this crisis. Here's the agenda that we're both cover today. Virginia Gray will be timekeeper for our speaker. And uh, to keep things moving, excuse me, I'm gonna put up the agenda now. Excuse me. Um, Okay, share screen should work, I hope. Um, are you seeing the agenda here or not? No. Nope. nope, okay, well, um, let's see it. Uh, there we uh, go. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, Virginia Gray will be our timekeeper. Virginia, want to raise your hand? Um, and to keep things moving as we, so we can conclude at 5.30 on time, she'll hold up yellow or red signs, I believe, indicating speakers remaining time or else time's up. Just a couple of ground rules. We are being recorded. The recording will be sent to all enrollees and you'll be able to add comments at, uh, at that time too, as well as in the chat, chat during the discussion time. Please use the chat function to write questions for our speakers. We'll try to address them at the end of all presentations. You can direct your question to one or more speakers. Please reserve comments for the discussion section. To save time, we posted the speakers full bios in the chat area, along with a resource list for this second webinar. We're starting off with a brief overview of how the town of Chapel Hill uh, sees the situation and a summary of its recent report on housing presented by David Adams. David's a retired professor, I believe retired. Is that true or yes, not? That's true. Okay, retired medicine, uh, professor of medicine at the Duke Cancer Center and longtime resident of Chapel Hill with special interest in environmentalism and its application to urban design. So David, the floor is yours. So Steve, would you stop sharing? Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And um, I, before I start, I would just like to urge you uh, to actually go to the link to look at Rod Stevens' actual presentation on November 5th of 2021. Uh, he does, of course, will do it better than I. And you also get to view the town council's reaction to some of his comments. So uh, I'm now going to share my screen, I hope. Mm -hmm. Uh, the use, okay, share. Can everybody see that? Yes, yep. very good. Awesome. awesome. All right, so as I said, I'm going to um, sort of hit the key points <clears throat> from Rod Stevens' presentation. Uh, he's done more than one. <clears throat> this will focus on the November 5th one. And uh, just to recap, um, what are the things that drive housing around here? And, and uh, one of the interesting facts is that it's jobs that drive housing and not UNC students, he found. And um, moreover, it's where those jobs are that are important. So here in Chapel Hill, we have a daily commuting tides that uh, compete with each other. We have an inbound tide of workers largely going to UNC, largely going to lower paid jobs. Uh, and in contrast to that, we have an outbound tide going to jobs, say in RTP, that are higher paying jobs. And I can tell you that I spend a 28 a year career on that outbound tide. In fact, it started when before I-40 was even completed, I was commuting on 54. So what does this mean? We have, it means we have the highest jobs to housing ratio in the region. That is 
we have a lot of jobs here, but not sufficient housing for workers. <clears throat> so what are the needs that are currently being met by our housing stock? On the left, you can see that uh, as far as undergrads for UNC, we're okay there. We have now a lot of market rate apartments, which is what single professionals appear to want. And we are more than uh, fulfilled there. But if you look on the right, there's a list of unmet housing needs. And of course, at the top of the list is our affordable housing. <clears throat> and by that, we're talking about uh, folks that are under 80% of the area median income, as well as low income uh, housing people. And you can see that, that currently our AMI is up to 84,000, which means that 80% is about 64,000. So you have to have a decent income really, even to get to 80% of AMI. I also wanted to break down that uh, number a little bit just to let you know what the extremes are here in Chapel Hill. 18% of households here earn greater than 200,000 per year. That's compared to 6% for other cities in North Carolina. At the other end of the scale, 12% of our households earn less than 10,000, and that compares to 6% again uh, statewide. But the, those uh, folks at the top of the list are not the only ones as you can see. And Rod Stevens pointed these others out. They're first time homeowners uh, looking for housing, their families with young children, their divorced parents who want to be near their children. They want to be near where their children go to school. There are empty nesters who want to downsize and modernize. And there are folks like me who are seniors. Well, what have we been building? In the 2000s uh, in Chapel Hill, we built mostly uh, owner-occupied single family housing. But over uh, the intervening years, especially from the 2010s to the present, mostly apartments have been built. And as Stevens pointed out, these are large scale projects that have little connection to their surroundings. More important, only 5% of the new units were condos or townhouses available for purchase. So much of the new development has been targeted again at young professionals who are not ready to buy, but many of them will, and they probably will end up choosing lower cost housing closer to their work and Chapel Hill could very well lose much of their talent. Okay, so how can we achieve the housing we need? And let me just start out by saying, We've done this experiment here in Chapel Hill. We don't need to go to Boulder, Colorado to figure out what to do. We've actually done the experiment and it's, you can actually drive around town and see the outcome. So what we've been doing is we've been planning project by project with no real comprehensive vision in mind. And the clear examples are the Berkshire apartments, uh, the Aura projects that are going up and the park apartments, which are just around the corner from me. So what does Stephen say we need to do? Well, he says we need to create neighborhoods. And to do that, you have to have neighborhood area planning. Again, we've done this. An example is Southern Village and Meadowmont. So those have, we've seen how that sort of type of development has worked out. There are pros and cons, I'm sure, but it's there for us to view and learn from and learn we should because we have these opportunities coming up uh, where there's a fair amount of land that's available for development. So the first being uh, example being what used to be OB Creek uh, has a different name now, but it's a large project across 15501 from Southern Village. Uh, recently, the White Oak Road area uh, has come into play, that's 41 acres. And then of course, the Green Tract. So we have lots of opportunities. And the question is, are we going to focus ourselves on making the best of them? So one of the important points that Rod Stevens made was, if you're gonna work with the neighborhoods, you need to figure out what the neighbors value. Well, again, this is not something that we're, we're in a vacuum. Uh, in various different times, 
the uh, Chapel Hill community has been surveyed for to see what they value. And here are some of the things that come up on the list. First, open and green space. We really value our parks. It's one of the top priorities when people are surveyed. Along with that, we like mature trees. We want a tree canopy. We don't want saplings. Uh, we want pedestrian friendly development so we can walk, we can bike, we can rollerblade. And then we've made a commitment to act on climate change. So we want green design, green construction. We wanna limit the mass of buildings that, that pop up. And we would like to see aesthetically pleasing architecture to go along with it. And then again, we would, we would like to have adequate public transit to go along with these features. So if you go back again, as I said, we've done the experiment. If you go back to Southern Village and you go down this list, you see Southern Village checks all of these boxes in comparison to Blue Hill, which again is close to where I live, it checks very few of these boxes. Okay, so now let's move along to what the town is doing. The town is actually involved in a couple long range planning uh, processes for development. The acronyms are LUMO and FLUME. And the key, uh, key tool in this process, other than finding out, of course, what the community wants is what tools are available to apply to this process. And of course, the major tool is zoning. And the question is, can we use zoning to get what the community wants as opposed to what developers are demanding and most of the time what they're getting? Along with that zoning or basically a subset of that zoning is to try to limit conversion of affordable to market rate housing. An example, of course, in my neighborhood was the park apartments where we lost 200 plus units of affordable housing, but also, and maybe more important, the mobile home parks around where the owners are trying to, to um, convert them to market rate uh, housing. So zoning is a major issue. There are other ways to go about doing this. And of course we can, can consider financial incentives and other things beyond zoning. And I think the speakers coming after me are going to expand on these points. So I will end there and turn it back over to you, Steve. Okay, thanks very much, David. Um, a few words about our co-host, Linda Brown, who's really the chief impetus behind these webinars. Linda retired from a long and distinguished career as an innovative educator in the Baltimore area schools and universities, in addition to working as a community activist. She was a founding and steering committee member of the Northeast Housing Initiative Community Land Trust, which develops permanently affordable for sale housing. Since moving here in 2018, her deep concerns about affordable housing and environmental justice have prompted her to work with Chalt. Linda, over to you. Thank you, Steve. Our first speakers are Denise Jones Dorsey and Garrett Good. Denise is an anti-poverty activist and community organizer with a background managing human service delivery programs that fight material poverty. Once in charge of daily operations at the Housing Authority of Baltimore, she was later executive director of My Brother's Keeper in West Baltimore that began by providing meals and expanded to providing workforce development, youth services and furnishing primary health care. Denise now serves as board chair for NEHI, the Northeast Housing Initiative, which renovates housing for sale to families earning from 30 to 50% of the area's median income, raising private philanthropic and public dollars in order to help reverse the racial wealth gap and create generational wealth. She is also board chair of Share Baltimore Incorporated a collaborative network of Baltimore's growing number of community land trusts. Garrett Good is president and CEO of NEHI. He is a developer of permanently affordable for sale housing in Baltimore with degrees in finance and law. He's an expert in affordable housing, real estate development and fundraising. He has served as advisor to federal and state governments as well as a consultant to Freddie Mae and 
um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and HUD, among other government um, organizations. Having founded and sold several businesses in 2017, he retired as president of a Garrett Good and Company, a government contractor and consultant to five, Fortune 500 companies, while currently serving on several boards um, in Baltimore. Denise and Garrick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous um, introduction. But I'd like to go, first of all, I want to thank all of you all for embarking on this journey to ensure that there is shared equity as it relates to land and housing and how it's used. This, is, uh, this journey is not for the faint of heart. So I am thrilled to be able to present to you all this afternoon. I'm going to talk about how we got to where we are and how we got to the conclusion of doing a community land trust. I'm gonna then ask Garrick to join me and share with you all what the mechanics are regarding the community land trust. And I hope to be able to finish very shortly, Virginia, so that we can then hear from our esteemed colleague, Ms. Battle, who is absolutely amazing. So let's get right to it. In Northeast Baltimore, where I live, where Linda formerly lived, it looks like a suburb in the city. It is absolutely beautiful. And I'm a longtime resident. I've been here since 1979, moved to Baltimore. And myself and other peers, seven years ago, became very concerned about two phenomena happening in our neighborhood. One of it was the increased number of rental properties in our community and the anticipated devastation that we believe is associated with rental properties. These were not multifamily dwellings. These were individual homes, row homes that were being rented. Here was the challenge. We found seven years ago that the average rent for a family was $1,374. And these people were earning 30% to below AMI, meaning in Baltimore, 30% AMI is you're earning $15 per hour. So these are working people trying hard to provide homes for their families and they're paying this exorbitant rent. You know the mathematics. At some point, you're not gonna be able to pay that rent, you're evicted, you're on the street and all of the ensuing social problems that go along with that. So during a Linton reflection, an ecumenical group of people met to discuss the plight of our neighbors. And in that discussion, we decided, well, let's get smart. Let's find out, because we're all community people. We don't have all the titles and all of those things that have been mentioned. But we said, let's get smart. Let's find out what are other people doing who are facing these issues. And we actually received a grant to do a structured discernment. After we decided that we wanted to do a community land trust, and I will tell you what that is, we then received another small grant to develop a business plan. After we did develop the business plan, this is where like four years ago, we then decided to hire dedicated staff because we incorporated and so on and so forth. We decided to hire dedicated staff. And I tell him this all the time, Nicole and Linda have heard me say it, God delivered. He brought to us Mr. Garrett Good, whose credentials and passion and morality line up, and we've been able to do fantastic work. Let me go back. In our discernment, we were interested in finding a strategy that would allow us to provide housing for home ownership, quite frankly, to people who were earning between 50% to 30% AMI in the Baltimore market. So as I had mentioned before, if you were working at Johns Hopkins Hospital and was fortunate enough to earn $15 per hour, you could not buy a house. You were relegated to renting, paying these exorbitant rents, and you did not have the sense of neighborhood and community that you all are striving to achieve. 
what we learned was through our research that there is a national model that has been in place since the 60s called a community land trust. What that simply means is, is that the community holds the land and trust for purposes that they have defined. Those purposes could be permanently affordable housing. It could be holding parks and green space and trust. You could provide for a commercial space so that beginning businesses rents could be significantly lower. Those are the examples of community land trusts. We decided to do, we were, we were intense about this, that we wanted to do community land trusts, housing for home ownership for working people in Northeast Baltimore in the most challenged neighborhood in our footprint. Because we were bold enough to say, if it's going to work, we're going to try it here because we knew that the benefits would be safe, decent, affordable housing, the reconstruction of a neighborhood, and for the seniors who have stayed in that community and held on, we would reverse their plight and begin to address the appreciation of their properties that they held on to and supported through maybe 40 years. The community land trust model is a shared equity model. So the homeowner does not own 100% of the home. It shares with the community and later you'll learn how that affects the market price. But what I do want to emphasize is we do not use the term affordable housing, which regrettably has a very negative connotation in the real estate market. And there are people who of goodwill will fight against the term affordable housing because somehow they believe it's going to depreciate their value. In fact, that's the term that was used often to facilitate blockbusting in Baltimore. And I might add, Baltimore has a dubious history because we are the city where the whole concept of redlining was developed and codified at the turn of the last century. So we got a lot of sins we have to correct. Having said that, we are interested in what's called permanent affordability. And what that simply means is there's a one-time investment in the property that then passes forward as the property turns over. If you all decide you're interested in learning more about community land trust and its mechanics, I'm excited to share that there's actually a policy house known as Grounded Solutions that provides these services uh, to land trusts across the country, including data research. And, and Grounded Solutions is also a policy house because this year in the Build Back America Better Act was passed, there's a carve out for community land trust because they are proliferating all across the country. And let me just share with you two good stats about them. First of all, people, the community land trust communities are very stable and thriving. They, uh, during the 2008 uh, recession, folks wanna call it something else, but it was a recession where people were losing their homes only 1% of the people who lived in community land trust housing were foreclosed on, 1%. In addition to that, what we have found is, is that families stay in a community land trust home for about 10 years. And then they are in a position through growth and stewardship where they then buy their next house at full market. And they of course are wonderful uh, property holders and participate in the community. One of the best models for community land trust is DSNI, which is in uh, the Boston area, where the community came together to fight for their neighborhood and to restore their neighborhood. And in fact, there are YouTube tapes, Linda, about DSNI that folks may want to see because it's an amazing story of how community empowered itself to. Uh, 
elevate itself in many, many ways. And now that property is one of the most desired properties in uh, the Northeast of our United States. One other item that I did want to address when you all were talking about policy and zoning, I do want to lift up for you that one of the challenges that you all may have to look at as well as it relates to rentals is that the policy in Washington right now is skewed towards providing dollars for the development of rental properties. So you may really wanna work with your um, congressional delegation to make sure they understand how that does not necessarily um, bode well over the long haul for communities like the Chapel Hill community. But I do wanna lift that up. Right now, the HUD policy and funding, which was created by the Congress, is biased towards rental developers. So I just wanted you all to be aware of that. I'm going to stop here because I think I gave a, an overview, but I would like to pass the um, gavel to Garrett so that Garrett can share with you all the mechanics. How does a community land trust work? But Garrick, I would love for you to begin with a couple of our success stories. Perhaps we could begin with the retiree who just purchased a home, share her story, and then share what her mortgage payment is. Okay. Thank All right. Thank you. I will um, see, share. Let's see. Hold on. Oops. Um, Good afternoon. I am Garrett Good. Um, first, recognizing our chair who uh, just completed, uh, uh, Ms. Denise Jones Dorsey. Um, you know, one of the things that when I talked to Linda Brown, um, who is a past board member of NEHI and one of the members that was um, in actively involved in my recruitment, she said, just tell us how it works and what's made it work for us. Uh, First, we had great leadership like that of Linda Brown, who we miss dearly every day. So good to see you on here. Um, um, and also, I'm glad to be a part of the panel with both my board chair and Nicole Battle, who has been a mentor, a friend, and a coach in some of the work that we're doing in Baltimore. So I say that to say the story that we've done, because we do deeply and passionately believe in housing as a, as a right um, for families in Baltimore, uh, one of the one of two actually we've we sold eleven houses today as part of the Community Land Trust. In two thousand, we, we announced a plan to two hundred homes by twenty twenty five. One of the families that purchased, uh, she actually was Miss uh, Miss Wilkes. Miss Wilkes actually has been working had been working for over two years trying to uh, find a home in a home that she was. Um, that she would be happy to live in. She came from the um, housing authority um, and she had a uh, had been approved for a mortgage of $75,000 and she had not been able to find anything anywhere su suitable for the 75,000. We worked with her and was able to get her into a, a brand new two, well, a completely rehab two bedroom home uh, that was originally uh, at 135,000 we were able to give subsidies to bring the price down to the 75 she had been approved for, uh, which she now is uh, happily residing in that home since January of this year. And her, her payment with um, taxes and insurance is $487 a month. Um, and she is over the moon with happy, um, as I said, she's retired, had worked for the city of Baltimore for 30 years. Um, and, and is excited and she said that she feels like the community has given her something back. One of the things that Baltimore has is unique from a number of cities across the country is that we have what's called the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is the um, corpus we've been able to use to provide some of the subsidies I speak about um, that drives the price down for families that are uh, to make housing deeply affordable for those at 30% half, um, uh, AMI, like Ms. Wilkes that I shared, um, as well as we have another senior that that we've heard, she just recently changed her name to Ms. Johnson, 
um, our board chair had gotten us a spot on um, the radio store, uh, radio to do some talks about affordable housing and our work. And she called me immediately following and she said she had made some decisions and that she wanted to, she had rented her entire life. She worked for the county library system and that she wanted to uh, do something different. And she wanted that to be start with home ownership. So she is actually not only got into a home, she's paying, I think 580 a month in her example. She's, she's just recently as of next week will be joining our board uh, and helping us to continue to talk about home ownership and how we can make it deeply affordable for residents in the city of Baltimore. One of the things I think that was most successful in um, making me able to come in and do the work that I did, bringing the tools of my career to Baltimore was the work that Denise, Linda, and some others did with the planning of putting together, as Denise mentioned, a business plan. Um, I think Mr. Adams talked about in his um, presentation about looking at things from neighborhoods. And I think that is uh, um, some success in that, in that when you look at the community and understand who the community is and what they want and listen to them, then you actually can adequately develop um, housing. And so our vision, mission, and core values is one of the things we put in, and as well as our competencies, which you see here. And our mission is simply to build community one home at a time. And we understand that our, that our challenge or our mission is just beyond, is more than a home. It's about a house plus that that makes up the home. And so we do through our stewardship programs, a lot of pre and post counseling, as well as identification of needs that it takes to get the family into the house, as well as to keep the family in the house once they purchase. So we do much programming that goes around or centers around those two activities. One of the first things we did or that I took from the business plan was come up with what we call our business model because you know, everything is made up of processes and we had to come up with a model to define as well as to put costs to it to decide exactly how we can make it successful. Because one of the things that we quickly saw is that we were getting, we had a house donated to us and when we did the math and got the estimates, we found that it was gonna cost us more to rehab it than the value of the house would be once it was done. So quickly we went back and we looked at how do we create a business model that allows us to be able to do our work, use the sources of grants to be able to enhance our work, but also a model that can actually sustain itself long-term. And so this is the results of that and that we came up with basically seven steps and that being acquisition, the final being the case management or stewardship that happens post sale. Um, we do, um, we've partnered because one of the things we said we would not do is recreate the will, but build upon the many resources that exist in the city. And we actually bring those together to be able to come up with what we call Northeast Housing Initiative. One of the things that we key things that we've done that has allowed us to be able to really propel ourselves to the 11 houses that we, we've sold to date um, was to be able to bring our construction in house. Uh, we were able to cut costs about 35% by simply doing the management of the construction process. We don't have, uh, con we have a contractor on staff, but we do subcontract out most of the work that happens uh, in the rehab and development. So what we were able to do from that is come up with a standard as well as we're able to deliver a volume. And we're able to be able to now scale that up to, um, in this, this year we'll see uh, 35 houses being done. And in the COVID uh, years, we saw a lesser number being done. But what we've been able to do is we know that today, if we acquire a house from a donation of zero to as much as $20,000, that we can keep that house to break even at the, at the $135,000 to $150,000 uh, price point. One of some of the things that we do and that we can assure is that all houses that we have have all new appliances, has had all of their um, wiring redone, as well as has all new HVAC systems. The appliances include a washer and dryer, and it'll have a new roof. Uh, one of the things that we found in the community, it happens a lot of times when company, people come in and do rehab is they do cosmetic work that makes it look good 
with a fresh coat of paint. But when you look at it at the end of the day, the roof needs to be done in three or five years, uh, which in many times or cases, the family is not in a position to afford. So then what happens is the house is not, ma is not maintained at the level it needs to be maintained. So our one of the certificates or seals that we put on any house that we do is that the families is not gonna have to do any major um, renovations once they move in because they're gonna all be done as part of our turnkey approach to um, permanently affordable housing. So these are the seven steps. Uh, we can deliver a house uh, completely gut rehab with all the things that I've talked about. Our cost is uh, typically around 100,000, no more than $110,000. And the key driver with that is is just us doing the management of it in-house. Uh, the Community Land Trust, um, as um, Denise Jones Dorsey stated, there are uh, four of those throughout Baltimore. Nehi is located in East Baltimore, which is the purple. Uh, we have others that fall under the umbrella of SHARE, which includes um, other areas within South Baltimore, as well as within Midtown. Um, as well as Cherry Hill, which is actually in South Baltimore as well. One of the things that we did is that we focused on one community. And one of the things that was made before my entry into NEHI was coming up with a plan of identification of the community in Northeast Baltimore that could be best uh, impacted by the work of the Community Land Trust. And as a result of that, it will bring up the price points of the houses in surrounding communities or neighborhoods. And so the, the community that was actually selected was the four by four community. One of the things that we did once um, I started was to come up with a community plan where we did the long-term objectives of figuring out how we would work with the city to do acquisition of as many of the houses as, po as possible. One of the things that's happened as a result of some of the work we've done with the Community Land Trust is other providers have now come in like Habitat as well as uh, St. Ambrose, which is another provider of housing. And then we've taken the leadership role of making sure that we're all working together. Because one of the things that NEHI has done in addition to just doing the rehab is we have census on our community and that we know who lives in each one of the houses all the houses that are vacant, the story behind each of the houses, and we're able to, to sh share that data with um, our partners to make sure that we're making the biggest impact because we're not to compete. We're simply to look at how we raise the total community up. And one of the things that NEHA does is we do ongoing programming to um, at the request of the community. So we support the community association as well as we identify the things and the resources that are needed, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about some of those that came in this result of this plan. And I think three years ago now, uh, we actually kicked off an open house of our first home, which is behind us in this picture. And Excuse we did that me, with... I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're about five minutes over now. Oh, okay, uh, well, I only got two more slides. Thank you. You want me to stop now? Well, I, I, I think it would be good to wrap it up and not show all the slides. Okay, so um, this was a, a presentation that we did with um, Mayor Scott, Mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott. So just to quickly jump ahead, um, this is some of the, the things that we did is beautification of the alleys um, that we're working on now, as well as we did community green space which you would then, as part of our stewardship program, we're doing um, in this four by four community. So our job is to not only do the um, acquisition and rehab of, of vacant and abandoned homes, it's to support the community long-term to determine exactly how we best can support it long-term. Uh, and that concludes uh, what we do at NEHA. Uh, our number website and our phone number is listed on the site. Thank you. Linda, you're muted. Got it. Um, I'd like to introduce Nicole Battle. 
Nicole holds degrees in landscape architecture and master's degrees in business administration, as well as in city and regional planning and public policy and management. Having begun her career with Govins Ecumenical Development Corporation, GEDCO, in 2006 as director of real estate development, she now serves as its CEO, as she has since 2013. Nicole has more than 20 years of professional real estate and management experience in promoting and addressing community affordable housing needs with extensive experience in community and master planning and managing the development process for urban residential communities, among them the development of over 500 rental and home ownership units. Nicole oversees GEDCO's senior community, homeless and supportive services, and manages the real estate development and consulting part of the organization. She is completing the development of Stadium Place, an affordable senior housing community located on the site of Baltimore's former Memorial Stadium. She currently serves on a number of Baltimore area community boards. Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, hello everyone and happy Palm Sunday. I'm very happy to be here this evening. And um, I wanna thank Ms. Denise as well as Garrick for being great partners. And um, you know, it's been a pleasure working with you both in really promoting community land trust affordable home ownership model within Baltimore city, as well as being advocates of affordable housing in the city. So thank you guys as well. Um, GEDCO is very happy to um, be here this evening. And um, I hope that we can provide just a little bit of information about our organization um, that is helpful to you all. Let me see if I can do a share. So um, as you can see, GEDCO has, um, I wanna first say GEDCO has been around for 30 years. We were started by seven pastors of various denominations in the Govins neighborhood, and they really got together to address the need of affordable housing for older adults with supportive services in their communities and their congregations. Um, since starting 30 years ago, we have expanded our mission and our focus to not only provide housing and supportive services, for older adults, but we also provide permanent housing and services for those who have experienced homelessness, as well as community services, um, which addresses emergency needs, such as a food pantry or hunger, um, poverty, we have an employment center, we provide eviction prevention assistance, as well as utility assistance, prescription assistance, um, as well as resources for anyone who may need an ID or just access to services that are at the city level. GEDCO currently has about six, sorry, 17 full and part-time staff, as well as four consultants that really help us meet mission. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were started by seven pastors of various denominations, which at that time formed our member organizations. We now have a total of 55 member organizations, which consists primarily of churches of various denominations within Baltimore City. We are governed by a board of, at this, I think as of today, we have a board of 21 individuals from the community. Um, we also have various committees that assist us in implementing mission and really taking care of the things that we do as an organization. Um, GetCo has four lines of business, which I kind of touched on earlier, as you can see on the screen. Um, older adult services, which includes a senior center we manage, um, a couple of older communities that address the needs of older adults, as well as older adults with disabilities, um, and stadium place. And just on the screen are just some of the things that we were able to accomplish just last year. In addition to older adult services, we also have our community services cares, which is what I had shared earlier. And this just gives you a sense of the services we offer to our residents as well as the people in the community. 
And then for our homeless and supportive services program, we currently own and provide services for men and women who have experienced homelessness within our Hartford House and Micah House properties. And these are just some of the things we have accomplished over the last year. Um, GetCo is a pretty complex organization. We have, um, because we own probably about 12 communities um, and various real estate, we have different entities that we also manage, which kind of the screen right here kind of shows you all of the entities that are tied to our various programs within Northeast Baltimore. All of the housing that we provide is housing that is affordable to individuals, um, primarily in older adults, as well as people who have experienced homelessness. The screen in front of you here is really just all of the various sources that we have um, secured in order to develop the housing that's affordable throughout Northeast Baltimore. As mentioned earlier, we are the master developer of Stadium Place, which is here, which is where the um, former, where the Colts and the Orioles used to play. Right now, it is an intergenerational retirement community um, that provides housing and supportive services for older adults who are 55 years and older, in addition to a state-of-the-art YMCA. And just recently, last October, Gilcrest um, Baltimore Services moved on to our site. So now we also provide hospice for older adults as well as children at Stadium Place. In addition to the hospice and the independent living and the Y that's on, on our site, we also have a short-term and long-term um, facility that addresses the needs of older adults within the community, primarily focused on low-income adults. And here is just some of the properties that we have developed at Stadium Place. And this is Gilcrest, our most recent partner who's moved over to our site as well. GetCo is right now in the middle of completing our strategic plan. Um, and I don't know, hopefully you guys can see this. We're at the last stage of our strategic plan, but it's really been focused on enhancing the programs that we currently have, really listening to the people that we serve and trying to figure out how we can be better partners to our residents, to our participants, and to our clients. Our other goal has also been to really build and strengthen capacity. I had mentioned that we have 16, 17 full-time and part-time staff. And honestly, probably each of those staff people really operate as um, one person operates in the capacity of three people because there's so much work to do, but limited number of people to do it. Um, another goal for us is really growing our real estate development um, program, which currently we have myself and a, consult a consultant that is working with us, as well as cre creating financial sustainability. Um, as an organization, we have multiple sources of funding, um, but as you all know, as a nonprofit, you need the multiple sources of funding in order to keep your doors open. So our primary focus really with the last year of our strategic plan is to continue to diversify our income so that we can continue to meet mission. Um, I hope I'm within my 15 minutes. Um, if you have any questions or any need any, um, if you have any comments or if there are any questions, this is my contact information. I'm Nicole Battle, Chief Executive Officer at GetCo and I'm very happy to be here. Steve, there? you're muted. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, what you folks uh, from Baltimore, including Linda, have been achieving is really astounding and heartwarming and um, really gives hope. I have to move on now to Russ Stevenson, um, our final speaker. He's an architect with specific interest in improving people's lives with urban design. 
an accredited practitioner of leadership in energy and environmental design, or LEED. Russ has worked on projects for the state of North Carolina, for Triangle County governments, and for universities, among other organizations. He's been an urban design consultant on many planning projects from Virginia to Florida, including two uh, North Carolina projects that earned statewide planning awards, facilitating and authoring part of Raleigh's comprehensive plan. He's also served on the Raleigh City Council, I believe 14 years, and various community projects and organizations, several of them concerned with historic preservation and urban design. Welcome, Russ. Right. I think I'm unmuted. Now the question is, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, move this screen over to this screen so I can see it better. Um, well, thanks for having me today. Uh, I am Russ Stevenson. Uh, you heard my bio. I'm actually uh, subbing for uh, Bob Gary at the last minute who uh, had another commitment he could not escape, uh, but I'm happy to be here because this is a, a amazing, uh, amazingly educational panel you've had so far, so I've learned quite a bit. Uh, I'm, my presentation is going to give just a, sort of an overview of um, affordable housing needs and um, solutions, potential solutions in Raleigh. So, of course, we all uh, are familiar with this kind of a slide, that widening affordability gap that is being experienced all around the nation and Raleigh being one of the fastest growing cities, of course, is experiencing it uh, as many, uh, more than, than, than most. So question is, well, in that continuum, in that <laughs> of uh, incomes, which households are being impacted the most? Excuse Russ, me, Russ, we can't see your slide. Can't see my slide. Well, Just you need a piece yeah. of it. Resume. There, yeah, there we that's go. Good. That's good. Wait a minute. Am I there now? Yep. Okay. So there you see. It's a. This is a Federal Reserve uh, Bank of St. Louis data that I used to pull up this chart that just shows the the widening gap between new home costs and family incomes. And uh, obviously the uh, the picture it's painting is pretty bleak for um, people. Uh, whose uh, incomes are not keeping up. And of course, those folks um, uh, are oftentimes folks uh, with lower wealth. So now I'm going to advance my slide somehow. I might have to move this whole screen back over so I can see my controlled here. There we go. So here, um, so defining what Raleigh's greatest housing needs are, of course, all of you folks here who are familiar with HUD uh, funding, federal funding streams know that part of that is uh, to uh, develop these uh, consolidated plan. And so I just pulled uh, a few highlighted lines of text from a recent one here in Raleigh, uh, that describes the summary of housing needs. So as it says here, very low and extremely low income households are most affected with 16,600, almost 17,000 extremely low income households experiencing severe cost burdens, uh, which means they're spending more than 50% of their income on housing and utility. And of course, very low income households are ones at, um, at or below 50% AMI, extremely low or at or below 30% AMI. Uh, then sort of the corollary problem that we're facing here in Raleigh is that um, gentrification is pretty rampant. Uh, and so their report says the need for affordable housing is further exacerbated by loss of naturally occurring affordable housing, either demolished or redeveloped into market rate or luxury apartments. So uh, what are those people in that um, extremely very low income and extremely low income housing look like, well, this is a slide actually from the Wake County's affordable housing plan from 2017. And you see that the, the kinds of people that are impacted most by this lack of affordable housing in Raleigh are people that we really depend on uh, to, to make our city work. So example here, at the, under 30% of AMI would be a third, three person household making 20,200 doing home health aid work. 
Then going up the line, you see from 30 to 50% AMI, a salesperson with a single person household. At the same 30 to 50 preschool teacher with one parent and one child at 28.5. And then firefighter. So there's a whole range of um, households in the city of Raleigh that are being priced out. They're severely impacted by the rising cost of housing compared to incomes. Um, so with the uh, flood of reporting about affordable housing crisis and the various production initiatives that we've heard some about today, how can we actually measure whether we in Raleigh are gaining or losing affordable housing? And so the next slide is one that um, I actually had our housing and neighborhoods staff, the city staff prepare back in, I think it was 2019, but it's a very simple one, but it tells quite a tale and that is, First line you see are all the occupied units between 2010, 2015. I think that's 2015, 2016. Then you see uh, occupied units paying rent and you can see that those are going up as well. Then rents, units with rent under 999. Now that 999 figure was a sort of a, a placeholder to try to capture um, the range of different household sizes that, that you, uh, you know, from one to four and so forth, and, and the kind of rents that on average would be affordable to all those different households. And so what you see, while the number of units are going up uh, and units paying rent are going up, the number under that affordable threshold is actually going down. It's going in the other direction. And then uh, as a percentage of rental units, those affordable ones, you can see in 2010, it was 75% of the rental units were generally affordable, down to 55% in 2016. So if you do some simple math and calculating the year over year loss of affordable units, you see that there's um, every year, except for this one, we, there was a big bump in, in new units coming online. Um, there's a tremendous loss of affordable units, uh, either from renovations, demolitions, or uh, other market condition changes where the, the rents went down. So the, the bottom line of all this is that even though Raleigh says, well, we're doing all we can possibly can do to um, build affordable housing, the reality is we're not gaining ground on this problem. We are actually losing ground at over a thousand units a year. So that's, uh, now this is actually a slide that my fellow counselors and, and staffers really didn't want to produce. It took me about a year to get them to, uh, to produce this to, because obviously everybody, those elective office, you want to make, tell happy stories about how you're building a few new units and it looks great, but, uh, but the reality is, is quite different and you can see it here. So I'm going to talk about uh, next. I'm going to try to talk about next um, three categories of affordable housing solutions, and uh, one or two of them have already been talked about here. Uh, but on the funding side, is, is to increase subsidy spending, uh, and I'll have a slide for each of these three: taxation, reduce property tax burden. Of course, that's where community land trusts can play a big role, and then regulations: how to incent the market to produce more affordable units. So under funding, um, Raleigh has a dedicated penny on the property tax to affordable housing, uh, which uh, is, is good, but that's not coming close to getting us back into the category where we're actually building more affordable than we're losing, gaining more than we're losing. Um, the other thing obviously uh, Raleigh does and other municipalities do is, is float um, affordable housing bonds. And so uh, in both of these cases to, to really catch up effectively, we'd we're gonna have to uh, dramatically inc increase dedicated funding in the budget, but also in, um, increase the amount and frequency of our housing bonds. Under taxation, well, I'll start with the second bullet because you heard all about that, uh, how community land trusts can help eliminate that property tax burden and has all kinds of corollary benefits on sort of dampening the uh, property value increases. Um, and then um, some, this one, the first bullet is a, 
a property tax grant. This is something that a, that a um, nonprofit called One Wake is proposing for Wake County now. And basically what they're saying is that for uh, long-term homeowners, low-income homeowners, uh, that they would get a rebate on their property tax uh, that would help then uh, reduce uh, the property tax bite uh, that they experience. So the idea there is to help uh, reduce dislocation, you know, and folks being forced out of the home because of rising costs. Um, one thing that I've suggested is that it's great to do that for established long-term uh, low-income homeowners, but uh, we should also be uh, creating similar programs for new low-income homeowners because we want to create a new, we don't want to just maintain <laughs> the uh, uh, long-term residents in, in lower wealth neighborhoods and protect them from gentrification, but we will actually want to attract new uh, affordable housing in, in those neighborhoods as well. So, and the final category uh, is regulations. And I, in my parenthesis, I'm saying besides trickle down because the current city council uh, focuses all of their uh, discussion about um, regulatory change around just increasing the overall supply. And of course the, the, the implication or the, the actually uh, very uh, vocally demonstrated or um, uh, comment about that is, well, if we just build enough, you know, eventually uh, uh, it'll force prices down at lower levels. The, the problem with that is in this hot market where there's so many high wage, high income people moving in uh, just building more market rate and luxury housing won't ever add to the, not anytime soon, to the supply of affordable housing at lower income. So um, one thing that uh, we instituted when I was on city council, but the new council that has come in and is very pro-development, uh, uh, we started a program of voluntary affordable housing conditions. In fact, we... Um, hired the city attorney away from Asheville because one of the reasons being they had such a great voluntary affordable housing program going in Asheville where a majority of their multifamily developments were negotiated uh, in zoning conditions to include affordable units. And so we started doing that in Raleigh um, as a way to not only say, uh, let's have the taxpayers fund more affordable housing, but let's also let the, the uh, development community um, um, pitch in and, and produce some of those affordable units too. And so we started doing that, but now uh, the new council has come in and they've completely cut that off. They decided, no, uh, we don't want to cut into developer profits. We'll go back to this idea if we just uh, maximize profits and units that it'll eventually trickle down. And uh, that you know, remains to be seen for sure. Then the other one is uh, density bonuses for affordable units. And the, the, one of the most widely known examples of that is uh, missing middle housing. That is to say, uh, in recent years, the housing has either been at a mid-rise height or a single family height. And there's not much in the way of duplexes, triplexes and, and quads and so forth, and certainly not in single family zone neighborhoods. So there's been uh, an effort around the country, and I know you've all heard about it, to try to in increase the supply of affordable housing by eliminating uh, single family zoning in what was formerly single family zoned neighborhoods. And so um, there's a great opportunity there. Uh, again, the problem in Raleigh has been that um, the council has said, yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and add that dense, gentle density in those, in those formerly single family neighborhoods. But they've not applied any of the uh, regulations to that that would actually incentivize affordability. And so my last slide is gonna be one that is um, just shows an example. This is from uh, Portland uh, where, uh, and this the, the picture you see here is just sort of a elongated city block that they're just showing different kinds of missing middle housing infill on the block here. And the, the thing I wanted to point to is, first of all, this is really, um, uh, model on the residential infill product project in Portland, Oregon. And I wanted to focus on three areas where you'll see that rather than where Raleigh is not requiring affordability. So in Portland, if you want to start building uh, and you can do singles, uh, where's my cursor, singles, duplexes or triplexes, 
uh, on a lot, that's fine, but you're gonna do it with a reduced maximum building sizes. And so here you see, and of course what that means is when you have a smaller uh, maximum square footage, it's gonna be a more affordable unit. So, uh, but we don't, our rules don't require any maximum or don't set any maximum building sizes. Down here, B, uh, family size four and six plexes have a affordability requirement. So what they're saying here is that half of the units uh, in these four or six plexes have to be rent at affordable at 60% of AMI. Again, in Raleigh, no affordable requirement in any of these infill project types that are coming down the line. And then lastly, this one is it's not so much affordability, but accessibility. And that is something where older people who have limited mobility, you know, um, that if you're gonna add density on a residential lot, that one of those units has to be what they call visitable, which is to say it has to be accessible. So, um, ground floor entries, ground floor bed and bath and things like that. So those are all things that the city of Raleigh could, I mean, they're modeling the, the, the densification, but without any of the affordability or uh, compatibility. And so that's, um, the, I think the challenge going forward in Raleigh is, is all those uh, kinds of uh, tools for increasing the supply of affordable housing. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Ross. Very enlightening about what's going on just next door, practically. Um, obviously, we share some characteristics uh, in terms of council policy between Chapel Hill and Raleigh. And I think we can uh, learn from each other on that score. Um, Julie McClintock will now take questions uh, picked from the chat room. And if we can't get to all of them, they will still be in your um, in the copy of our re the recording of uh, this um, program today, and you can add and uh, commentaries at that point. Julie, sure. Uh, let me unmute. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. All right, very good. All right. Well, I'm happy to help facilitate this portion of the agenda, and I think these speakers have been fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, so I'm inviting everyone who's attending this call to, and that would include uh, panelists as well, to uh, write questions and say who you're directing the question to, uh, keep it focused and uh, write your question in chat. And we'll get to those as many as we can. We have a little bit less than 20 minutes and we'll do our best. So please um, go forward. And let's just remind uh, the panelists, we have uh, Denise Jones uh, Dorsey, who spoke to us and Garrett Good um, about the uh, knee high and share programs, the community home trust models, which was quite impressive. Um, Nicole Battle talked to us about GEDCO, which is a very large organization doing a lot of work. And then Russ Stevenson from uh, previously of the Raleigh City Council, but very active in the affordable housing area. So um, to maybe say who you'd like to direct the question to, that would be good. Julie, you have one question to all the hosts and panelists in the chat. Yes. Um, what are the biggest opportunities and challenges for the guests and panelists? Um, that's a pretty big question. And if we get to all of them, what, what, do, what do I suggest maybe we come back to that? Because if we have everybody comment that we won't get to any of the questions, what do you think? Um, uh, here's one from Jeannie Brown. She says, thanks to the individuals from Baltimore and Raleigh for sharing this great information. Following up on the presentation from David Adams regarding the housing study, I wanted to let everyone know that council will be discussing townwide visioning and transit oriented development coming up. And additionally, in the next month, the town's housing and community staff will be sharing their quarterly affordable housing report. For now, the town's affordable housing master plan strategies and progress can be found and it's in the chat. So that's just a comment. So I wanna thank you, Jeannie, for providing that. Um, do you think that we have time to go and what, what is, so Russ is asking everyone, what are the biggest of opportunities and challenges for, uh, for the guest panelists? And I guess you're, you're referring to the others. 
uh, Russ. Yeah, Gedco and Nehi. All right. I'll so go, um, I'll let's... be happy to go first. The uh, greatest greatest opportunities is organizing community for self determination. That we involve folks who spend most of their lives working to become a part of the politics where they begin to understand how their government works and advocate for themselves. The second uh, most exciting piece is putting together the funding. And as was mentioned, the community led the creation of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which became a charter amendment. Our constitution and bylaws was amended by the community to create this fund. And then guess what? We figured out how to fund it without raising taxes we access 1.3% of the typical recordation tax to fund it. And as I sit here today, there is $35 million in the fund to be expended in the next fiscal year. So those were the those are the opportunities. I'll let someone else talk about the challenges. Denise, do you mean uh, that is like a real estate transfer tax? Is that what Absolutely. it is? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, others like to to comment. Garrett, good. Um, I, I guess one of the biggest challenges always is more money, um, and in creating the you know the best opportunity for housing. One of the statements or questions that had been mentioned earlier was about rental being part of the community land trust, and uh, a, a good well rounded community land trust will offer both um, or various types of housing options as people in the paradigm have needs at different sections. So we're actually looking at building rental housing now as part of the, um, for people who are getting uh, prepared for home ownership. So um, that would probably be another challenge. Outstanding. Uh, let's see, Nicole Battle. Yes, um, I guess the opportunities are just the partnerships. There's a lot of organizations who, um, who are focused on building communities that are mixed income and affordable for people within the city. Um, there's also this federal funding that has trickled down to this from the to the city and well state and city level so that we can use those funds to address the affordable housing needs in the city. Um, challenges, you know, there's a need. <laughs> And costs are, you know, costs are crazy at this point in time, um, especially construction costs. It's a huge challenge for anyone who's developing anything this year. And, um, you know, supply is low, demand is high, and it's just really competitive um, for people who are developing housing that's affordable. It's um, not many sources, and it's very competitive to secure those resources. Russ, did you want to comment on what you've heard? You're muted. Great to hear this, this range of, of organizations. Uh, obviously, GEDCO is, is a very large organization, has been very successful in finding funds and, and using them to, to produce product. Uh, I guess NEHI is uh, closer to the, the kinds of community land trusts that I've heard of before. They're always on the lookout for who's going to donate land or who is going to donate funds or, or uh, to, to help them with their mission. But um, uh, in all of these cases, it, it really does come back to um, a commitment from the community. And I guess I'll say the elected officials to say, yeah, this is a priority. And that's kind of why I put together that chart uh, that shows how, uh, even though you may talk about a lot of happy stories about building a few affordable units here and a few there and 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 maybe even doing uh, some larger uh, tax increment um, um, excuse me low-income housing tax credit projects that uh, at the end of the day the, the market in a hot market like this the affordable units are going away so much faster than that really uh, uh, makes it hopefully clear to the elected officials they got to do more in terms of uh, dedicated funding, uh, bond funding, and other kinds of partnerships to, to really uh, um, grow the um, supply of affordable and, and, main, and renovation retention of affordable units. So 
Uh, everything that I've heard today suggests that there are um, a lot of great ideas out there. It's just, again, it, it, uh, in my view, it's a matter of whether there's that political will uh, in, in our elected leaders to say, um, we have to do more. So related to that comment, um, Russ, Nancy Oates asks everyone, what's the best way to work with council members to get them on board with some of these initiatives that have been successful elsewhere? And I see Linda has her hand up. You know, I, I have to brag a little bit about what we did in Baltimore because before Nehi, our city council didn't even know what a community land trust was. They didn't know. We had to educate the council. We went before the council and testified about what a community land trust was. When we got over that hurdle, the banks were skittish. They didn't know what a, a community land trust was. So we had to educate the bankers. In addition to educating the bankers, we had to come up with a, um, Denise helped me out here, um, uh, like a sample mortgage. There was one other community trust in Frederick, Maryland. Some of our members went to Frederick, met with them, saw the kind of um, mortgage that they had developed because one of the banks we were, we were working with wanted to charge us, what was it, $20,000 to have their attorneys do it? So we did it. <laughs> we actually, with the help of um, the University of Baltimore Law School and the University of Maryland Law School, their graduate classes help us put our legal documents together. I mean, we started from scratch. We didn't know squat. We had to educate ourselves and everyone else. And I must say the really helpful thing, we had a city council who was willing to listen and who worked with us. That's excellent. Well, we've got a couple more comments from panelists, David Adams. So um, yeah, I have two comments. Uh, one is as far as challenges, <clears throat> maybe somewhat unique to Chapel Hill is we have the rural buffer and was put in place for environmental reasons. We didn't want to have sprawl, <clears throat> but the result obviously is that we had to increase density in the areas that, that were available inside the buffer. So, they, so we have that challenge um, and it leads to density and density as we know has its own has its own issues. Um, I also wanted to reply, I see Nancy Oates' the idea about the best way to work with council. <clears throat> I think that should be extended to say, how can we work with the staff? Because the staff, for whatever reason, has taken on the role of being advocates for developers and at the detriment to the detriment of what the community wants, in my opinion. So so really, um, it's a twofold question, not only council members, but how, how do you bring the staff members over? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good comment. And Denise uh, Jones, Darcy. Thank you so much. As it relates, I'd like to add on to what Linda had offered regarding working with our elected officials, because you're not just talking about your city council, you're also talking about your state representatives and your congressional representatives, because the HUD money, which is an incentive to the developers who are in business is part of our whole government structure. So what, what has to happen is we have to believe enough in ourselves that we have the answers to our concerns and that we take on the role of educating and advocating for what we believe are the answers to our concerns and then ensure that the policy is written in such a way that it incentivizes what we're trying to accomplish. As I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why the developers are doing what they're doing as it relates to for-profit rental is that the HUD money that's in place right now is biased towards for-profit rentals. Mm -hmm. If we believe that a portion of that Build Back America money should be for affordable housing, for home ownership, for the first-time homeowner, we need to communicate that to our elected representatives, particularly at the state and federal level, the congressional level. So that, that's what I have to offer. 
Okay, we have, um, I'm going to continue with the questions. We want to get as many as we can in. So um, Steph Mundell uh, asks the panel, is it possible, how is it possible to get developers to take on their fair share of responsibility? Yeah. That's a tough one. I'll be happy to answer that. Go oh, right ahead. The funding formula. So the funding formula that they could, believe me, these guys and gals are not spending their own money. They have public dollars that they're leveraging their money, but the public dollars is in the preponderance. So what you have to do is ensure that the funding formula from HUD that comes through your state legislature is, is organized in such a way that they have to do their fair share. And trust me, they will. Excellent. Um, so Hank El Elkins is, has a question here. Hank is um, someone who's actually been very involved in the rental, uh, developing a rental uh, subsidy program for the town. And we've had it work successfully as a pilot program and would like to see it grow. So Hank asks, for all speakers, what has been your approach for justice involvement, potential owners or renters? Can you clarify that, please? Let's see if we can bring Hank in. Uh, no, I can't seem to do that. Um, I oh, think okay. he's talking about um, formerly incarcerated people ah. and, and homeless people. Okay. Well, um, as a developer and supportive service provider for people who have experienced homelessness, as well as um, some who um, have been incarcerated, we work with the Mayor's Office of Human Ser Homeless Services, um, which is a city agency to really address those needs. Um, more importantly, just really um, Section 8 certificates so that they can pay for their housing. Um, GEDCO, with each of the units that we develop, the affordable units, we have a supportive services component. So we have service coordinators who work with those individuals who um, have experienced homelessness, who may be suffering from addiction, or um, just different, um, or a combination of issues. And we really help them create goals. Um, we help to put them in contact with services within the community that will help them improve their situation. And we've had um, quite a few people who have moved on from our homeless and supportive services programs to market rate housing where there isn't a service component. So I, I Hank uh, Elkins is on. Uh, Hank, did that answer your question? Well, let me let me clarify what our problem, I believe, is partial of a problem in Chapel Hill. As far as I know, we do not have any major apartment complex that uh, will go by HUD's general view of a case by case basis to look at former uh, prisoners' justice involvement. Uh, exceptions have been our master leasing program, which has reduced, of course, the cost of uh, evictions and the cost of uh, vacancies by having some money from the state, for, or, which allows us to master lease now about 48 units uh, for those with mental illness. But generally, we are fighting for those who are coming out of prison, a major battle to get housing here in Chapel Hill. And that is because HUD's guidelines for case-by-case -case examination are not used. It's a blanket approach. Misdemeanors for up to 10 years or more, or for felonies for up to 40 or 50 years, means that people cannot rent in our major apartment complexes in Chapel Hill. Thank you for that. Uh, Denise, do you have your hand up? I did. I wanted to also uh, respond to Hank's question. Hank, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, funding has everything to do with what the continuum of housing would look like. And the dependency on just that the uh, uh, housing authority housing is problematic because of policy. The yeah. other thing that, that we've done in Baltimore is we have what's called the Fair Development Roundtable. So different groups of people who are interested in renters' rights, housing our neighbors who are the homeless, the community land trust, we all come together as a unit to advocate our shared interests with the decision makers. And in fact, that affordable housing trust fund is not solely dedicated to community land trust. 
it's dedicated to providing dollars for persons who live along that continuum. So let me go back to your question about HUD enforcement. This is one where I believe it is absolutely imperative that again, your federal representatives, because HUD is responsible to the Congress, has to ensure that HUD is administering those rules uh, per the regulation. And I would urge you to get clergy involved in this advocacy, because that's one of the reasons why we've been successful. Clergy from various faith traditions have come together and continue to come together in Baltimore to advocate for what the word says is the least of these. Hank, I hope that's helpful. If there's, you, any, if there's any specific information you want, we can link you to people like Alpha Justice here in Baltimore who could really help you with that challenge. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Jeannie so Brown sorry. has a question. Can, can people tell us more about the carve outs from the Build Back Better plan? Because I remember you said that <laughs> You, you had managed to get funding in the better Build Back Better plan, which I don't, has that passed though? Mm -hmm. It has passed. The carve out is, uh, it's at the federal level and the carve out is for the community land trust. So as this was being negotiated, dollars were set aside for community land trusts across the nation. And the entity that was responsible for submitting the legislation and then advocating for the legislation is Grounded Solutions. Uh, they have a website. Garrett, can you give folks, ver can you put the website in the chat for folks as it relates to Grounded Solutions? The yeah. other thing, while we're talking about carve-outs, going back to Hank's question, one of the things that you all may want to look at is there's ARPA money that was related to COVID and so on and so forth. Hank, you all may want to look at that ARPA money to make sure North Carolina, specifically Chapel Hill, because I know Raleigh has done this, Russ, look at what money you all asked for and how you want to spend it. I'm sorry, you all, if I'm getting excited, I am just so thrilled to be with people who want to make a change. So I <laughs> apologize for being so positive and excited. I'm looking for maybe one more question. We'll, we'll probably need to close out because we're very close to the end here. Um, Can I also mention something yes. really quick? I don't know if in fact there is a, an inclusionary housing bill there, but that is something that different jurisdictions, particularly those counties, those high cost counties, I would say, in Maryland are starting to look at, especially Baltimore has an inclusionary housing bill that doesn't really have much teeth, but they're really working on that. And that's really a way to um, really spread the efforts among all developers, just not, the, just not those developers who develop affordable housing, but also market rate developers. It's a great where every, Yeah, where everyone takes um, a part or a role in really addressing the um, affordable housing needs of whatever jurisdiction. That's you're one in. actually that Chapel Hill has taken on and they did it informally and then they got a formal ordinance to do it. The pro biggest problem though with it being effective is that the market is now uh, encouraging banks to loan on the rentals. And so um, the inclusionary zoning does not apply to the rentals. So that that's, it's, it's uh, blunted the effectiveness of the ordinance. So I think we need to wrap up and we have a couple more really interesting comments and questions. I hope you all read them. We will read them. Um, and I would like to just turn to Linda Brown uh, just for a quick closing. Uh, Linda, thank you for putting, inviting all your friends from Baltimore. This has been fantastic. Mute, okay. Well, this really has been great and it makes us realize that we've just scratched the surface um, when it comes to this issue um, and possible solutions. So it's clear that we're really gonna have to do another webinar with more time for discussion and a chance to explore some of the policy changes that we can advocate for right here in Chapel Hill. And we'd also like um, to bring back Peter Sabonis for such a discussion as well, and maybe some more of our, our guests today. A home represents stability, security, privacy, and it even has an impact on one's physical and mental well-being. 
Building housing builds community. And when even one person is lifted up, we are all lifted up. No one should be homeless and our community can help solve this problem. Thank you to all of our participants. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you panelists. Thank you, audience and, and attenders. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. You Baltimore folks are awesome. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Very nice. All more yeah. rocks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to our facilitator, Steve Fleck, too. Thank you. And Virginia Gray. Right. Yes, and our timer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we end on time. Yes. It makes me proud to have been born in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.